And we are live. Um, hi, this is Bob Boros, and this is my jazz and tap dance life. And um, I am now going to have an interview this evening with uh, Melanie George as part of my Preserving the Jazz Dance Heritage series. Uh, we just had a little technical aspect that was kind of interesting, but we managed to solve it. So it looks like we're going to be um, okay. First, a little bit about the channel. Things are doing very well. We're approaching 2,000 subscribers. Um, people are still interested in the channel. And so thank you for everybody who's been subscribing. And we will continue to bring as many um, videos on Jazz Dance as we can. Um, right now, I'm a little break from doing studio work. We're doing mostly the interviews. But once my academic work stops in about two weeks, um, I'll have more time to do some things that are a little bit different in terms of the studio. So um, anyway, we are going to get to this now. So I'm going to bring Melanie into the broadcast right now. And here she is. Hi, Melanie. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for being on this um, interview program. Happy to be here. Okay. Um, now, you have been um, involved with jazz dance very seriously um, in the academic world and now in branching out into many other different areas. Mm -hmm. um, so um, as somebody maybe who is not familiar with people who are watching this, maybe you can just give me an idea of, um, or give us all an idea of, you know, what is your background in jazz dance? How did you get started? What is your interest? You know, where did you come to the point you are right now? I know that's sure. a big question. Yeah, it is a big question. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I like a lot of people in my demographic, I was a, studio, a dance studio kid. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm, I'm from Michigan. I'm from uh, suburban Detroit. Okay. And so my dance studio uh, was a studio called Annette and Company School of Dance, uh, which was run by a woman named Annette Burgas, who is Joshua mm -hmm. Burgas's mother. Oh, OK. Um, so if you're familiar Great. with his work on, sure. on in musical theater, uh, he yeah. and I grew up together. I'm actually a year older than him. And so we've known wow. each other for a really long time. I haven't seen him in years, but you know, that, <laughs> his mom anyway uh, was mm -hmm. my teacher, one of my teachers. And that studio was. You know, it was the 80s, so that studio was very much riding that line between mm -hmm. theatrical jazz and uh, what was happening in sort of a more of a pop realm, you know, because right. music videos were, were huge uh, mm -hmm. during that period. And so um, my train, my early training was that blend of those things. Um, I took ballet, but wasn't especially good at it, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, also was a tap dancer. Um, and then I went to college, and I was really fortunate that my school, my undergraduate at Western Michigan University was one of the few schools that emphasizes ballet, modern, and jazz equally. Uh, mm -hmm. That's you know typically not what you <laughs> experience. Oh, I'm so sorry, yes. I forgot to close mm -hmm. my email. So let me do that right now. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I actually was able to study uh, ballet, modern, and, and jazz uh, throughout my time there. Mm -hmm. And we had faculty who were specialists in each of those areas. Um, you know, typically what happens with college education and dance is they're going to make you into a modern dancer, whether mm -hmm. you want to be one or not. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, I know and, it happens. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I certainly as an academic in my adult life have been a party to that process as well. Um, but I was fortunate that I didn't have to let go of my jazz identity completely when I came mm -hmm. to college. And then, you know, I graduated and I really saw myself as trying to forge a career as a modern dancer. And I did that for quite some time. And I'm still teaching jazz. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and then when I got to grad school, it just my entire focus just shifted. Uh, that I was probably out of I was out of school between grad and undergrad for about seven or eight years. Oh, that's uh, good. And so when I that's good. Yeah, it was a long time. Yeah. And I was you know actively teaching and working and mm -hmm. had good gigs and you know performing and all of those things. Um, and when I decided to go to grad school, um, I made a work. Um, in my second semester, I think, of grad school, if I'm recalling correctly. And it was um, centered around jazz dance, which I'd already been thinking about wanting to focus on that. And then I was hired um, on the adjunct faculty of the institution that I was going to school at. Mm -hmm. um, so not just a grad assistant, but was actually like hired. Mm -hmm. um, and I um, was teaching all of the jazz classes and, and figuring out how to um, revise and um, improve my pedagogy, I was really beginning to ask some questions about the relationship between jazz dance and jazz music. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's sort of been like no turning back since then. So mm -hmm. um, I my first job out of grad school, I was at Kent State University where I was one of two jazz mm -hmm. specialists along with having other things that I was you know teaching. But um, that was one of the reasons that I think made me attractive mm -hmm. to them as a candidate was that I was a jazz specialist. And, um, and then when I was teaching at American University, which is also where I have my graduate degree from, 
uh, I was um, one of the only jazz faculty there as well and was the um, liaison between the musical theater program and the dance mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so you know, that's sort of the academic thing and, and along with all of that, you know, I was still making dances and publishing and being an advocate, which is, you know, a big part of how I see myself in the field is, is being an advocate mm -hmm. for the visibility and health of jazz dance. Um, and uh, still doing all of those things. So, okay, yeah. all right. Well, I want to talk about that, but first let me go back a little bit because you were talking about how you developed your approach to jazz dance. Are there particular styles or techniques that you were familiar with that sort of drove you in a certain area or is your approach sure. mostly from your own research and your own ideas? I mean, it's a, it's a hybrid, you know, that I think that's probably where I'm most like where my training, my mm -hmm. modern dance training and my jazz training overlap and that the way I teach modern was very much a hybrid of things I'd been exposed to and the same uh, goes for my jazz uh, practice. Um, what I will say is um, coming, going into college, you know, and, and being um, a student in Michigan, which is very, very close to Chicago. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, right. It means that, so I was, at, I was in Kalamazoo, which is really only two and a half hours from Chicago. Um, and so, um, I was exposed to, you know, Giordano mm -hmm. and, um, and River North was very close by and, and I was really fortunate in my freshman year, uh, second semester of my freshman year, Joel Hall was in residence for an entire semester. Wow, that's and So great. I got to study with him as a freshman and sure. bless him, he <laughs> cast me in a piece I had no business in. I was not ready to be in that work, but he saw something in me I didn't mm -hmm. see in myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and so the, you know, and, oh, and Billy Sigenfeld, that's where I first met Billy mm -hmm. Sigenfeld as he came and gave a guest lecture, uh, to us and, and performed. And mm -hmm. I've since continued on a, you know, a very long relationship with him and his company, um, for many years now. And so, um, all of those things, you know, and Luigi mm -hmm. and all of that stuff, I think was mm -hmm. where I was situated. And then, you know, being an African-American woman, being a black woman in the United States, you know, there's a there's a vernacular sensibility that I came by mm -hmm. through living, through just you know being a part of my family mm -hmm. and my culture in this world. And so, um, when I got to grad school, I was really trying to figure out how to pair those two things because mm -hmm. the vernacular side had been completely absent from all of my training. Like That's just, right. Just yeah. absent, and um, and I was finding as I was doing research that there were ways that I knew how to move. I, I had a sort of a blood memory of how to move in certain ways mm -hmm. without knowing what the steps were called and what the history of, what, of those steps were. And I also grew up in a household in which jazz music was present all of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so okay. I understood how to, how to listen to that music and how to mm -hmm. move to that music because it had literally been my upbringing. Right. Uh, so that was sort of what, what, what I was leading to my next question yeah. from listening to you, because you were talking about maybe styles or different approaches that are just physicalizations, but what about the musical aspect? You know, what about the, the feeling and what you hear in jazz music and how did that drive you? Yeah, you know, music's always just been a big part of who I am anyway. I think, you know, I'm a dancer who really wanted to be a musician and mm -hmm. found that um, I had a decent voice and I, you know, played a few instruments, but I didn't have vision <laughs> for mm -hmm. how, for what could be great world. And so dance was something I'd always done that I also felt passionate about, but also felt a way, a place where I could have a voice uh, with, mm -hmm. the, with the actual artistic practice. Um, so yeah, the music is always just been, like music and relationship to music in any way for me as a dancer mm -hmm. is primary. Uh, and mm -hmm. then like I say, in grad school, it was like, I really want to pair my understanding of listening to and dancing to jazz music that like none of my peers seem to have any relationship to. Like they really mm -hmm. didn't know how to listen to this music or move to it. And mm -hmm. that became as one of the sort of guiding principles of how I was gonna mm -hmm. teach and create coming out of, of graduate school. And as I began to sort of figure out what is my niche in jazz? What is the thing I'm trying mm -hmm. to do that is separate from other, other people are doing? Right. Although I mean, there may be a lot of overlap, but what is the mm -hmm. thing? And figuring out you know, the branding of mm -hmm. the work I do, which I call Neo Jazz, uh, the relationship to jazz music um, and its sister forms of funk and blues mm -hmm. uh, is you know, a major underpinning. Like okay, that. now how has that worked in um, your your academic work? 
Um, Because as you said, you know, when you work in institutions, quite often, you know, modern dance or even into ballet is is where the the primary emphasis is. And there's a certain way of thinking about dance based on that heritage. You're bringing a different approach. So how do you have to, how do you... uh, uh, how do you live within that and how do you educate that other aspect as to the thing you're doing and as to what the value is in your work? You know, I was really fortunate that my first job out of grad school was at Kent State where they really value mm-hmm. um, a historically well, informed good. approach yeah. to teaching jazz. And mm-hmm. so I was able to experiment and try some things about how to infuse my teaching with the history um, that set me up to do all the teaching that I do now. And I think mm-hmm. had I had I gone into a job at a different institution, it would have been significantly more difficult for mm-hmm. me to be able to hang on to that voice. Because as you right. say, the things that are valued primarily are going to be ballet and jazz. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, as I've gone out to um, teach at other universities, be it either in a full-time capacity or as a guest, um, they know what they're getting when they're getting me, <laughs> you know, that, like I make it pretty clear. Right. I, you know, I, you know, I, I, mm-hmm. I, I think I do a good job of, of, of languaging what that thing is that I get. That said, the students um, have been known to say things to the effect of, well, you know, there's Melanie jazz and then there's jazz. <laughs> <laughs> and what they mean is there's the thing that Melanie's doing. Um, and then there's the things that I was taught in my dance studio, right. you know, which may right. or may not be jazz, to be frank with mm-hmm. you, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a there's a learning curve for them to understand that, like, for me to teach from a historically informed place is responsible pedagogy, right? Mm-hmm. It would okay, be good. It, yeah. it would be negligent for me to give you the impression that, you know jazz starts jazz dance starts in the 1950s because it's simply just not true it's mm-hmm. historical mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. yeah i've just been lucky i think um that uh paths were cleared for me to do this work and then i'm you know resolutely going to die on the hill of the kind of work that i do <laughs> no matter what so, okay yeah. so you've taken this idea now and you're not just doing it only in teaching or in choreography you have your hands in a lot of different areas mm-hmm. in terms of being an advocate for jazz dance and and just bringing this this idea to a wider range of people so maybe you can sort of talk about all the different places that you put your work right now sure yeah so um everything that i do is under the umbrella of jazz is dance project um, mm-hmm. i believe that jazz is ultimately a democratic and a communal practice. Mm -hmm. And that is why it's jazz is dance project and not Melanie George jazz Mm projects or whatever. That's just, and that's something that's just for me, you know, Mm -hmm. realize that everyone else isn't going to necessarily have um, that perspective. And I don't, you know, necessarily need them to, but Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's, I didn't want, I didn't want to, if I was going to be an advocate, I didn't want to start with my name first. Mm -hmm. Uh, So what that means under the umbrella of jazz is, is that, you know, I'm regularly teaching and choreographing primarily on college students um, because um, that's the the realm in which I am am very well known. And so that's Mm -hmm. where I am fortunate to get a lot of work in that in that way. Uh, It also means that um, I'm doing scholarship and I'm writing. And so um, doing some things for Jacob's Pillow and contributing to um, Mm -hmm. the book that you and I are both in as as authors and Mm -hmm. an upcoming book as well. And um, uh, and then as a uh, as an advocate, I've created a website called Jazz Dance Direct, which is a searchable directory Mm -hmm. for uh, companies that identify jazz as their primary mode of creating work and they have to actually mm-hmm. use the word jazz. <laughs> they, can't, they can't, you know, they yeah, have to actually yeah. reference it at some point. Um, mm-hmm. So companies, um, events and festivals that are jazz centered, uh, publications, which for the purposes of my website, that means books. Um, mm-hmm. And that and those books can be in print or out of print. They can be really great or really bad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to mm-hmm. create a, com- uh, you know, really um, comprehensive literature review for things that are, that are saying that we t- we're writing about jazz, no matter what it is. Some of them are for children, you know, but it's all, all right. in there. So companies, mm-hmm. events and festivals, publications, organizations identify as being jazz focused and uh, college programs that have jazz integrated in the curriculum. It's not an elective. Great. Uh, so, th- so this is all available on the Jazz Direct website. 
Uh, you can actually find it a couple different ways. You can put, um, you can go to jazzdancedirect.com and that is the actual website. If you go to my website, which is melaniegeorge.org, um, links to all things can be found there. So there's mm -hmm. a section on uh, Jazz um, is Dance Project and, and that's how you find a link to Jazz Dance Direct. Mm -hmm. It's all available okay. on that website. All right, so yeah. once, once this um, broadcast that we're doing now goes into um, where it can be accessed in the future, I'll be able to put that in the description. Fantastic. So the links will be there and that way people can get that information Great. Thank too. You. Um, we do have uh, many people watching. I just want to remind you if you're oh, watching, wonderful. you know, you can, you can put in comments and you can also ask questions for Melanie too. So don't be shy. If there's something you particularly want to ask, uh, put that up there and we can pull that up and make that work, okay? So now why don't you talk a little bit more about um, the Jazz Is Dance Project? What is sure. that that you're putting together? So um, like I say, it's the umbrella name for all things that I do jazz because I do have an entirely separate career mm -hmm. as, a as a dramaturg, as a dance dramaturg. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I do lots of other things that are related to facilitation and audience education. And so um, my jazz work has its own name um, so that if people are trying to reach out to me for that, they know where to find that. If you look for mm -hmm. Jazz's Dance Project, you'll find all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, extends to scholarship and choreography, really exploring what my voice is and how my voice is changing. Um, it's interesting to be getting into you know, my middle age years as I approach 50, uh, uh, to find that my body doesn't move the way it used to and still mm -hmm. trying to figure out what is, uh, that what is that voice when I cannot use myself as the primary model on which I'm mm -hmm. making work because mm -hmm. these needs just don't frankly work very well anymore, you mm -hmm. know? I know uh, that feeling. So, <laughs> yeah, it's tough. Getting older is, yeah. as a dancer is tough. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, still making work, actively making work and um, doing college residencies throughout the year where I get to go and teach students and, and either restage a work that already exists or set a new work on them. And all of those are under... Um, the 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 style that I call neo jazz, mm -hmm. um, and uh, jazz's dance project is the things that Melanie does in jazz. But it doesn't mean that things are not neo jazz aren't related to jazz's dance project. It just means when you're getting my choreography and teaching, that's mm -hmm. what you're going to get. Is you're going to get this particular way of moving mm -hmm. um, and uh, this particular de democratic communal improvisatory mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. All right, that's oh, an interesting yeah. term. Can can you define a little bit more what you mean by democratic? Because yeah. I have an idea for something else, but let me ask you that first. So, you know, um, partly how I come to know jazz, um, certainly as a, um, a post-grad, how I come to know jazz is by reconnecting to my jazz music roots. And um, mm -hmm. what jazz music taught me is that there is a place for everyone's voice within the composition, mm -hmm. you know? When you listen to a great Duke Ellington tune, you know, and he makes room for the soloist to do what that soloist does, you know, that's a place where it's still Duke Ellington's tune and it's still Duke Ellington's orchestra. But you know, when you hear those great soloists on those records, that that's also about them and those two things can coexist. And so I'm trying to create an environment where dancers are feeling that they have, um, agency to bring mm -hmm. their own voice to the work. I'm disinterested in getting them to move just like me because only I can move like me. And there's something that they're gonna be able to do that is unique to them. And I want them to bring that to the table. That's what's interesting mm -hmm. is how all of those voices blend and what I feel can be a very democratic, mm -hmm. open process where, all, we, where voices are, all these voices are coming to the table. Okay. That's how I see it as being different. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because with my research into okay. Eugene Loring, who created what he called freestyle dance back in the 1940s, and that's where mathematics came out of. Mm -hmm. And so Eugene Loring wanted to have aspects of ballet, aspects of modern dance, aspects of jazz, all different things mix it in. And he said because he wanted a, quote, democratic form of dance that would take the best of many different genres, pull it all together, and meaning that that's what America should be about. It should be yeah. about the best of all the things that come together. And he didn't want um, the, the definitions to be in French terminology. And he renamed everything, you know, as an English terminology rather than uh, pulling yeah. from the, those old things. So anyway, using that term democratic, just pulled that out of my head from, from Eugene I, Lawrence. I, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that because I'm starting to really think about um, 
with all the talk I do about um, making the Africanist roots primary in my work, um, even though my work is a hybrid and represents a colonized experience mm -hmm. in terms of training, um, I'm still using these ballet terms and I've mm -hmm. lately been really thinking about, is it time to let those go? Um, or be at least more judicious about when I'm bringing them mm -hmm. out. Um, and if they don't apply to this particular vernacular perspective that I'm using at that moment, then there should be maybe mm -hmm. some other language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even when, when he would teach it, there were other teachers who would teach within that freestyle framework and they were free to put their own emphasis as to what their ideas were. So it wasn't that they did his version of freestyle. You could do many different versions of freestyle. Yeah, I, I'm a believer in that for sure. Yeah. For sure. And, and Even with Neo and Neo Jazz, there are elements that I've identified, but I've purposely mm -hmm. not trademarked this term because my feeling is if you feel the way that I have outlined this thing applies to your work, then you mm -hmm. should use that term too. Mm -hmm. Right? That's also part of the democracy of it is that mm -hmm. I'm not trying to go up it anything and claim it as I'm the only one doing it or it's exclusively mine. That feels mm -hmm. very anti-jazz to me. Right. Okay. All right. I'm going to pull in a, um, a page from your website. Sure. And, um, and I know people probably cannot read this, but cause it's smaller, but I will go into here and there's some things you're talking about your um, philosophy mm -hmm. and um, let's see. Yeah, um, one thing you term in, you term in here in in composing the definition in this manner, I seek to unseat the privilege of Eurocentric dominance in mm -hmm. contemporary jazz dance. So there's mm -hmm. a couple of things if you could just like sort of define for me. There's a very fluid, big uh, aspect called contemporary jazz dance. What yes. do you mean by that? <laughs> and how, how is there a Eurocentric dominance within there? That's an interesting uh, comment sure. that you made. Uh, yeah, so this could actually be the whole conversation that we have exactly. here, <laughs> just that one question. <laughs> you could be here for uh, days. Yeah, uh, so, and the, for the purposes of that particular paragraph, when I'm mm -hmm. talking about contemporary jazz, I'm talking about jazz that's being made now. And for me, this this whole excerpt that you're looking at comes from a, mm -hmm. a, a much longer paper that's called uh, Pas de Boussole, mm -hmm. making the case for uh, neo-jazz as a contemporary jazz technique. Uh, because what I was encountering was when I would explain, this is what I do, people would say to me, that's really great. But, you know, you got to bring it into the present day. And my thing is that the idea of something being historically informed does not inherently mean that it's not contemporary, mm -hmm. right? We don't put that on hip hop dancers when they're referencing, you know, some of the, the vo vocabulary from earlier eras. We don't say, oh, you're doing something old fashioned. No, we talk about how they're blending these things with their contemporary perspective of the movement. Mm -hmm. And so for that paragraph, I really do mean dan jazz dance that's being made right now. Now to get to your other question about like, mm -hmm. what is contemporary jazz? That is a very loaded uh, term that I think in a lot of ways is meaningless. Um, you know, jazz has always, jazz just keeps changing. It just, mm -hmm. it's, it's what it does, right? It's, it's, it's beholden to what's happening in pop culture. And because of that, we get that beautiful family tree with all those styles. However, um, what I'm seeing in a lot of what's calling itself contemporary jazz today is things that frankly look like contemporary modern dance, look like um, Gaga and a lot of times, you know, I see a mm -hmm. lot of work that is uh, arrhythmic and amusical. And it's okay to do those things. I'm not saying that those things aren't interesting and great and worth looking at. What I'm saying is what's making them jazz? Like, why are you still using this word jazz mm -hmm. if I can't trace any of the elements, if I can't find them anywhere mm -hmm. in the movement? Why are we still, why are why, why we, why are you, whoever mm -hmm. you are, still calling it jazz? That is a big question mark for me. And, um, and I and I'm perplexed by it. You know, I, I certainly want artists to be able to have their voice and have their signature. But I wonder, um, in a time when there's less and less jazz dance being offered in general, what connection do people have to the form, and um, how can they better articulate that in the way that they're using their body? Mm -hmm. uh, to get to your question about uh, the Eurocentric dominance, um, I am a believer that my, ja my, da my jazz dance education was a colonized experience in the sense that all of those historical roots, all of um, a ton of figures whose names I never knew was completely excised from my education. And I 
for many years replicated some of that teaching in my own practice where I would talk about only, frankly, those same five white men, right? Mm -hmm. You know, which is Cole and mm -hmm. Maddox and Luigi and Fossey and Giordano. And I'm not saying that their work isn't interesting. What I'm saying is it's ahistorical to start our teaching of jazz history with those men. That doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense. Jazz predates all of them. And even Jack Cole said, you know, jazz, all jazz starts with the Lindy. Like it starts right. with these characteristics of what was happening in the social clubs. And so, mm -hmm. you know, so then why are we saying, oh, like there's a father of jazz dance? That's ridiculous, mm -hmm. that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Because again, it comes from an Africanist formed, which is about community and about many people contributing. So there can't actually be a father. That's not realistic. Can we say that, you know, Cole was doing some things that other people hadn't done before in a theatrical context and, you know, changed the way uh, theatrical jazz dancing looked on stage and screen. Sure, we can say that. But what's what was being taught for a long time is that we were attributing the origins of the form to him because when what we was making it valuable was that there was this influence of these other forms with jazz, mm -hmm. right? That when ballet comes in and when modern dance comes in, and Cole was really brilliant at you know bringing in the East Indian dance and and Latin dances, at, you know, an Afro-Cuban perspective mm -hmm. and and. Uh, modern through by way of Ruth St. Dennis and, and Lindy is really great at putting all of those things together. But you know, I had never heard of Pepsi Bethel's name until Karen <laughs> Hubbard told me who he was. And I was already oh. working in the field. Yeah. You know, oh, I studied with Pepsi. I had a scholarship at the Ailey school when I was in college and I had him one day a week uh, for, that, for that one yeah. semester. And, and I just, God, I remember him. He's such a vibrant person, but yeah, you know, actually a couple things I still remembered and used in choreography many, many years later on um, the scarecrow, the scarecrow. That's yeah, a, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I'm interested in that, right. The mm -hmm. roots always. And then, you know, from a mm -hmm. sort of personal project that I'm working on right now is I'm actually really interested in the contemporaries of you know those dancers that we talk about from the 50s and the 60s mm -hmm. um, whose names are not appearing in any book and so you know when i talk to you or i talk to tom ralibate you know um jojo smith's name comes up all the time but mm -hmm. can you name a single book that jojo smith's name appears in you know like mm -hmm. it, like he's just not present and we mm -hmm. know for a fact that without jojo there's no broadway dancer <laughs> you that's know? right that's you right know? that was so, whole footprint yeah so right now i am completely preoccupied with jojo and um mm -hmm. and honestly frank hatchett as well because mm -hmm. even though he's a name that we know there's shockingly little scholarship around what he did mm -hmm. uh, and liz williamson is the other one that i'm, I'm sort of preoccupied right. with right, now. right. and Absolutely. looking at not only who are the what are the elements that we, um, that get sort of pushed down? Like when people talk about, you know, this, this vernacular stuff is fine, but when I'm, when I, I want technique and, you know, mm -hmm. and they really mean ballet technique, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. they want tandus and, and all, mm -hmm. and plies and degages and all that stuff. And that's, I do the, that stuff. Right. But there's a technique to everything. Right. And so, the Africanist elements also have their techniques, and for some reason, they're considered subservient in the. I mean, mm -hmm. that, I know what the reason is. That's racism, but you know, mm -hmm. but they're subservient mm -hmm. in the teaching, and so I want to flip that paradigm because it is the African elements that is where jazz comes from. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned with that, and I'm also concerned with these figures whose names get left out of books. Okay, well, is there a way that people are going to hear this message? and adopt it in whatever way they can. Cause I know that the dance studio experience and I had a dance studio for 16 years before I even got into college teaching. And it's really been co-opted by the competition industry, which yes. leads you to a certain style and look of dance, which does not allow space for, or, or even you know allow the existence of the type of thing that you're talking about. So is there any way that that can be brought to the attention of other people to to broaden their experience. Yeah, you know, I, I have very little contact with private studios. I certainly, mm -hmm. in my early teaching, that was how I made my money, you know, was really teaching mm -hmm. uh, young people in, in studios. Um, and I come out of that environment. And so I, you know, absolutely support um, studios existing and how, they, and how they're training dancers. And certainly dancers can do things that my generation Mm -hmm. We weren't even thinking about some of the stuff that these kids, these kids' bodies can right. do right now. Yeah. Um, but you know, in that that turn towards competition, which was beginning 
happen when I was graduating high school. Com the competition was mm -hmm. becoming more and more. Uh, and that turn of the attention towards that, uh, there isn't actually a lot of history being taught for anyone. Like if they're, you know, in any form, mm -hmm. in ballet and like contemporary, like that's just not a concern. Um, what I can say in terms of how I disseminate my research, um, in addition to, you know, publishing and, you know, talking publicly is that I, I infiltrate on the college level. Uh, and I've been very fortunate to be able to bring that to college mm -hmm. students who I think are, although it can be very startling, um, who are more equipped to hear it mm -hmm. than high school students are at the, right. if they're coming out of a dance studio environment. And there mm -hmm. are those few exceptions. Um, I've taught here and there where a dance studio, a private studio will say, would you come and do this with my kids, you know? Um, but it really is in college where it can be backed up with other pedagogy that's happening within their curriculum. Mm -hmm. So that they realize that like the jazz teacher isn't just making this up, <laughs> like, right, you know, right. it, it, that you will see this replicated in your dance mm -hmm. history class. And this okay. can be talked about in relation to other forms and all of your other classes mm -hmm. and if people will make a space for it. Okay, well, that's a good place to start. I'm gonna try to pull in a question here. Okay, and this is from Kathleen, and I know she's a big supporter of um, my channel. So she's asking, how is Neo Jazz different from contemporary, which also claims to bring together elements from all the other dance disciplines? Uh, I don't claim to bring in elements from all the other dance disciplines. <laughs> so let me be really <laughs> super clear about that. Uh, Neo Jazz is formed around um, some critical elements uh, for me, mm -hmm. which is that first and foremost, um, it is movement that is grounded Right, as opposed to focusing on center of levity, I'm focusing on center of lev of gravity, and we're very connected to the earth. Mm -hmm. So that's the first principle. The second one would be rhythm, syncopation, polyrhythm. Uh, the third one would be the use of isolations. The fourth is um, using doing focusing on weight shifts that come from the pelvis to facilitate footwork, because footwork mm -hmm. is a principle that feeds through all of the Africanist forms. Um, where am I on? I'm on five. Uh, <laughs> uh, the next one would be improvisation, uh, which is mm -hmm. completely absent from most jazz training Mostly, that I yeah. find. But again, because I am um, looking at um, the connection of jazz technique, j contemporary jazz training to the roots of jazz and also to what is happening in jazz music, mm -hmm. improvisation is primary to me. Um, uh, connection to jazz music um, and its sister forms, meaning funk and blues, and uh, honoring the individual and the group within the process, mm -hmm. be it performance, class, whatever, what have you. You'll notice within that, I haven't said anything about bringing in modern or ballet or um, folk dance or, you know, Baranatium. Mm -hmm. I haven't said anything about any of those things because I'm looking at jazz. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at jazz mm -hmm. from a primary Africanist standpoint. Um, that is then supported with all of the other training that I've received through the classical styles and the theatrical styles. But first and foremost is these principles that are very much aligned with where Africanist mm -hmm. comes from. Okay, all right. So now in terms of where jazz, and this is another tremendous topic, um, where jazz dance is now or, or where <laughs> things should develop and flourish, uh, you know, what ideas do you have about what, cause you're out there, you see so many different things, you know, yeah. what is your take on what's going on and what could help to improve it? Um, you know, I'm really heartened by what I see um, in terms of some of the work that's uh, getting presented. Um, there's not a lot of it that's jazzy, but mm -hmm. the stuff that is jazzy, I think is especially jazzy. And so I'm talking about um, Caleb Teicher and company, you know, which is mm -hmm. a, Lindy Hop Focus and Tap Focus Company. I'm talking about um, Efrat Ashery, which is um, primarily uh, urban dance styles, but also, uh, you know, there's some Lindy and jazz stuff in there as well. Uh, I'm thinking about the work of Camille Brown, which is uh, mm -hmm. extremely jazzy to me. Um, I think part of why it feels like there's an absence of jazz is because we actually need to broaden um, how we're looking at what's jazz. There's a work that, um, two works actually that I can think of by Urban Bushwomen. One is called Scat and the other is called Walking with Train, which is based on um, the music of John Coltrane. 
And these are two of the jazziest things I've seen in the past five years, but mm -hmm. we think of them as being a modern dance company, as being a contemporary mm -hmm. modern company. And, you know, Jawale, uh, who's the founder, Jawale Willa Jo Zoller, uh, she, her roots are jazz, you know? And so she made a whole piece called Scat that's about, you know, how she grew up in Kansas City, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, 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 you know, how jazz music has, has framed how she sees art, you know, and how she sees the world. Um, so I think there's actually a lot more that's happening out there than we realize if we would just care mm -hmm. to look beyond um, some fundamental things. That said, mm -hmm. um, what I see is that if you're looking for events that are happening, the most um, volume of stuff is very much in the Lindy Hop field. Like you could, if you were a Lindy Hop dancer, you could literally travel the globe all year long and find a different Lindy Hop event every weekend, like truly, mm -hmm. or at least once a month, if not, you know, I have probably... I don't know, 30 or so different Lindy Hop events out of my, on my website under the events page. Uh, in terms of companies, the concert jazz companies dominate, right? And so, uh, it's, so it's not even, like different, different areas of jazz are, are, are um, active in, in different um, parts of the field, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of scholarships, certainly um, those of us in academia or who have a connection to academia, we dominate that area. Um, in terms of organizations, it's kind of a, a mix of things. And so um, there is jazz happening. I, there can, there's always room for more of it. Um, I would love to see more jazz being performed that, that people could have access to to be inspired from. Part of why students aren't studying jazz so much anymore is because they don't see a direct pipeline to having performance opportunities doing jazz, mm -hmm. right? But what I'm saying to you is the skills I know as a jazz dancer are directly translated to being able to dance with any of those companies that I just mentioned. Sure, you know, absolutely. Any of yeah. them. Um, so it's, it's um, not as healthy as it could be, but it's not as, it's not, you know, I, I often see these articles that are like, oh, is jazz dead? No, jazz mm -hmm. is not dead. And stop saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but there are a lot of, lot of alternatives now that there weren't 30 years ago and 40 years ago. So, the, you know, there's just more divergent to go into contemporary and hip hop and different things like that. Whereas you just did, before it used to be ballet, jazz and tap. Yeah. You know, and then you would, if you were modern, you only did modern, then you stayed in the modern dance field. So there's a lot more mixture and a lot more of choices that people can do today. But you I know, think. I don't think that that's inherently true if you look at the black dancers, because, um, you know, something like the Clark Center in New York City, if you look at their roster of different artists they were presenting over a season in the 1970s, you'll see a range of stuff. And it's not uncommon that some of those different dancers were dancing with some of the same people. Or look at, you know, like, the, the archetype company, Ailey, if you're going to be in that company, you actually have to be able to do all of the things. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think it's that, you know, you, if you just do this, you can't do that. I think that there are dancers that I know right now who are working, who I see all the time, who I would love to have dance for me, who don't know what they're jazz dancers, but they actually already are jazz dancers. Mm -hmm. They just don't know it because there's, again, that pipeline is not there. Um, but we have to create that, you know, that's the whole reason mm -hmm. that Jazz Dance Direct, uh, that website exists is because I was doing all of these residencies and students would say, I love this experience I just had. Where can I find more things? And mm -hmm. I had no idea how to direct them. I had nothing to point them to. And so I thought I'm gonna make the thing that I want them to have mm -hmm. rather than complaining about there not being anything available <laughs> to them, right? Mm -hmm. And so yeah. that's my charge to everyone is, Rather than sitting around and whining about what we don't have and make the thing that you want and create more opportunities, build it and make people come to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I understand that. That's something I've done in, in, in my life, whether I started writing for a dancer newspaper years ago, there wasn't a jazz dance column. So I contacted Owen Goldman and said, can I write it? And he's like, sure, as long as it's for free, just send it to me, I'll publish it. And that started a whole different branch of, of, of what I did, or even now doing these interviews. So, you know, for anybody out there, you know, the thing to do is just take initiative, you know, and jump on it and do something. And exactly after you that. do it five times, then you get a foothold, then you really figure out, oh, this is the way I should be doing it mm -hmm. um, after five attempts. And then you can take it in a whole different direction, but just right. not to sit on it and not do anything.
yeah. at that point from there. Well, Melanie, you've got your like pulse on jazz dance <laughs> in America and everything that's going on. So you're doing so much. Um, is there any like big project you're working on right now for the future? Anything you're looking at or you're just um, doing all these different workshops? Right now, I'm areas? just assessing uh, what my threshold is for the amount of work I can take on and, and mm -hmm. do it in a way that is healthy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, because you're right, I do have my hands in many pots and I'm, and I'm right. really quite busy. Uh, and it's, you know, that's a blessing. Uh, but also just sort of figuring out like, what is the best use of my time and my energy. And so going into 2020, um, I still have, you know, lots of commitments to fulfill. I'm lucky that I have three res jazz residencies coming up in the spring. Spring. Right. Um, I'm doing some writing right now. As a matter of fact, this week I have to finish a book chapter <laughs> that's going to be due on Sunday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so uh, there's always, you know, those irons in the fire, but also I'm looking to, um, uh, I think, you know, in the beginning of, of trying to disseminate my work and be an advocate, my initial thing was to focus on volume. And now my, my approach is rather than, you know, trying to always go forward, I want to go a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. um, and and figure out a way to disseminate uh, um, um, more depth of research and uh, disseminate my choreography into different venues um, with uh, more than students, even though it's a privilege to work with, with college students. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, um, just doing some reassessing as I stay on this treadmill <laughs> <laughs> to keep all of the balls in the air. You know? right. But again, this is all blessings. I'll bless it. Good, good. Okay, well, people can get your information at melaniegeorge.com. Dot org. No, about org. Dot org. Yeah. That's right. There's a and romance writer and a pop star who have dot com and dot net. So <laughs> make sure you go to dot org. <laughs> okay, and dot org. And the other is jazzdirect.com. Jazzdancedirect.com. Jazzdancedirect.com. So and also, if you just do um, jazzesdanceproject.com, it'll lead you back to melaniegeorge.org because I own the right. domain, all the domains. So. Okay. All right. Well, thanks so much for taking time for this, Melanie. I appreciate this. Thanks for having me. And um, what we will do is, you know, this will be archived and put out there by tomorrow so people can continue to watch this. And um, all of those things that we mentioned will be listed in the description so people can have those links to take it forth. Okay. All, all right. right. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. I'm going to take you out from the stream right now. Okay. All right. So that's our broadcast for tonight. Um, and that was with Melanie George and um, part of the Preserving the Jazz Dance Heritage uh, series that I'm doing. And if you're interested in this and you like this information, please subscribe to the channels, click the notifications bell and click the like button. The more you do that, the more it tells YouTube that this is good information and it will then, YouTube will make it available to other people um, to look at who are interested in jazz dance. So um, that'll be it for today. Um, thanks for watching and um, please be watching because we'll be doing more um, interviews in the future. Um, thanks a lot. Bye now. <laughs>